The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Bitcoin, Ether, alts, NFTs, oh my, they're all looking up this morning to what do we attribute this rally. Joining us now to discuss is Bittrex CEO, Stephen Stonberg. Stephen, how are you, sir? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Great to see you. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about Bitcoin back over the 50,000 threshold. Uh, what's your read on the Bitcoin market? As Lawrence was alluding to earlier, Ether really has stolen the spotlight lately, but fifty back over, uh, but Bitcoin back over 50K would, uh, would welcome your thoughts. Well, I think, I mean, I agree with his comments, but I think you're seeing a huge wave of new demand. It's institutional demand. You've got Walmart, Apple, Amazon, they're all exploring opportunities in the space. Uh, Fidelity and BlackRock are making significant investments in, in the space as well and in buying into Bitcoin mining companies, Marathon, Digital and Riot, Blockchain. And you've also got institutional money continuing to pour in to the Grayscale uh, Bitcoin Trust. You know, Morgan Stanley just added huge uh, tranches of uh, GBTC into multiple funds. You've got El Salvador that they've got their Bitcoin law going into effect September 7th, where Bitcoin will become a currency legal tender in the country. And, you know, the Deloitte's uh, blockchain survey that just came out said that 75 percent of executives around the world see investing in crypto as something they have to do. So I think, you know, the last crypto uh, back in 2017, when we had the big rally, I, I don't think you had this institutional involvement. In fact, they were calling it rat poison. They seem to have come a, a big 180 and now they're just coming in. So I think this is continuing to drive the, the price up. I believe the term was rat poison squared uh, was Warren Buffett. Rat, yes, uh, you're right. Time. It was squared, worse than rat poison. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Stephen, when you're seeing what are you, right now on Bittrex, are you seeing more ETH volume in the past few days? Though, nonetheless, I mean, you, you, you talk about all these institutional interests into Bitcoin. Yes. Yeah. But are you seeing a lot more interest right now in ETH? And if so, are you seeing that institutional interest in ETH or is it still mostly retail? I mean, I think the thing with ETH, you know, you have so many altcoins that are based on ETH. So it's, a, you know, it's not just the ETH itself that's driving the price. But, you know, with ETH, you know, I think you have some of the same dynamics. I think institutions, when they're buying Bitcoin, you know, the, a lot of them are also buying ETH. I think they view that as the next kind of, uh, you know, no-brainer store of value. But I think with ETH, you have other utility as well. Um, you know, I think you're seeing, you know, huge price movements. The London hard fork in ETH was successfully implemented. That's and I think with all this interest in DeFi and NFTs, which there's huge demand, I don't think it's the same people that are driving that demand, but that, that's what, you know, I think a combination of these factors are driving ETH. But, you know, so it has all the same demand factors as Bitcoin, then it has all this sort of utility use cases, altcoin demand, DeFi demand that's also driving it and this whole sort of decoupling. But uh, what are the sizes like in ETH? I mean, are, are, are they still relatively small compared to in, orders in Bitcoin? Yeah, I'd say, on, I mean, right now, you know, on, on Bitrix Global, you see, I mean, our biggest volume pair is you know, Cardano, ADA. So, I mean, you know, to pay, it, which is, that, that's not a long-term trend. That's just what we've seen in sort of the last week. Right. I mean, obviously, then you have Bitcoin pairs. And then obviously, after that, you have ETH. So, you know, ETH still hasn't taken, on our exchange, hasn't overtaken Bitcoin in volume. But you know, it's it's growing in, in volume. Uh, Stephen, the other big star of the show recently has been Solana. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What's going on with Solana? Why has why it broken out so much recently? Well, I mean, you have high transaction speeds, low gas fees. That's really given Solana a major buzz. I mean, Solana has risen 67 67% or SOL, the token, in like the last week. It, the market cap is now $40 billion. I mean, since the beginning of 2021, SOL has grown a staggering 6,800 hundred percent. So I, you know, I don't think when you go to Morgan Stanley in their normal asset management business, there's not a lot of assets that have that kind of performance in a portfolio. So, I mean, it's just huge uh, demand. I think Solana is really emerging as a serious competitor to ETH, you know, for some of the issues that ETH has, they don't have them in, in Solana. So I, I would expect, to, I don't expect to see that kind of continued, you know, parabolic growth, but, you know, it seems to be here to stay. So any any idea what the next Solana might be or some other um, some other coins to be looking out for? Uh, I mean, if, you know, I think you know, Cardano, I don't again, I don't think it's going to have parabolic growth, but that you know, ADA has been seeing its own seeing its own incredible gains ahead of the Alonzo upgrade. You know, Polkadot, Avalanche have also seen huge gains as well. So I think there's what's interesting in crypto. It's not just all about Bitcoin and ETH now. You know, it's hard to pick the next winner. And, and obviously, there's such volatility that you know, a lot of these things can fall as quickly as they've come up. So, you know, I would still caution investors on this, but I think this space is exciting and you're going to see a lot more, more interesting tokens this year. 
So in general, uh, how would you break down your, your user base? Uh, are, are they mostly in, in, uh, retail, some institutional? What, what, what are we looking at here in terms sure. of how you see the flows? So with Bittrex Global, so we're the non-US part of Bittrex. We don't, there's Bittrex Exchange, which has US residents and clients. We have no US passports, no US residents. So within that, so it's global retail and global institutions. But you know, I'd say both are important and we're seeing a lot more institutional accounts coming onto the exchange. So I think there's been a lot of noise with some of our competitors who shall remain nameless about their regulatory standing and obviously institutions who have compliance departments really care about that. So in our case, our exchange is fully um, supervised by the Liechtenstein bank regulator, the FMA. That's an EU bank regulator. So we're under the Blockchain Act in Liechtenstein. We also have a secondary license in Bermuda under the BMA. So everybody has been KYC'd, AML'd on the exchange. So institutions like that. Liechtenstein is a AAA rated country. Swiss franc is the currency. So we're, it's an incredibly stable legal jurisdiction. And unlike some exchanges, we're very happy to say we do operate in Liechtenstein under the law there. We're not yeah. sort of in outer space or wherever, you know, not nowhere and decentralized. It's a totally centralized I wonder exchange. What, I wonder what exchange you're talking about. I, I couldn't possibly comment, but I think that, you know, it's playing very well in the story. I mean, we've seen a lot of institutions who maybe didn't care or just went there for the volumes. They're really panicking. And, you know, a lot of sort of the newer institutions that are more conservative that are coming into crypto, this stuff is hugely important. So, you know, I always say that the tortoise wins the race, not the hare. So hopefully we're, we're sort of the regulated tortoise is doing well, you know, with 311 uh, tokens still listed and, you know, over 900 pairs for a regulated exchange this is a pretty interesting proposition. So we're seeing a lot of institutional interest, obviously in retail as well. Uh, you mentioned some of these newer base layers that are sporting some pretty attractive uh, DeFi applications at this point in time. On the institutional side, are you seeing any evidence that these institutions that are buying some of these DeFi assets are actually using them on some of the lending platforms uh, that exist now on Avalanche or Solana or some of these other base layers? I think there is some use in it. I think probably, I, and again, this is all just a hypothesis. I think it's probably more just it's speculative and they're investing. You know, I think some of the institutions are actively involved in lending, but probably it's going to be more in Bitcoin and ETH and some of the more liquid coins, especially if you have hedge funds that are coming in. You know, they're not going to be able to dabble in really illiquid markets. They're going to look for liquidity. But I think, again, over time, as some of these you know, altcoins become more mainstream, you'll start to see more institutional interest in them. Do you do you see the institutional traders sort of paying attention to these incentive programs that we're seeing from these various base layers? I know Avalanche had a big one with $180 million trying to get liquidity mining going. Are people paying attention to that stuff or is that more for the hardcore crypto natives at this point? Well, I think what's interesting is some of the traditional people are becoming hardcore crypto. I mean, look at you know FTX's last funding round. I mean, you had Paul Tudor Jones, you had Brevin Howard, Alan Howard, and you know Brevin Howard's very active in crypto. They have a whole crypto arm set up. So I think you know, a lot of these you know, traditional finance guys are really getting into crypto. Not all of them are calling it rat poison squared. Some of them see the opportunities. And again, they're, they're arbitrageurs, they're speculators. They'll just trade in and out of these markets. But they've dedicated a lot of you know, long-term resources into this market and not just investing in the markets or investing in the cap table of some of these companies. So I think you know, you'd be surprised at who's now investing in this, which is why they care. Like They have really strict compliance departments, these companies. So you can't they can't trade on some company that says they're under no law and in outer space. It just doesn't work in the real world. <laughs>